Yeah. So when we're talking about igniting a passion, you know, sometimes I don't know if anyone else has felt like this, you feel like something's missing uh, <coughs> until you learn the deal. And I definitely had that feeling. Uh, I learned Japanese first, but then I really had this sense that I was missing out on something, that a part of me wasn't expressed. And if I think about my husband, uh, a big part of him is that he has this whole connection with his spirituality that as a woman is really important to me. It just means that our men can express themselves in all their entirety and they have kupu to express things that I think is quite dangerous if you can't express it or if you don't feel connected to it. And so for us that is disconnection. I'm not saying that the reo is the only way to connect. Definitely kapahaka is one way and that is why we all feel that emotion and that kaha, particularly of our men being able to express everything that they are. Uh, but if you don't have that, you know, you can see sometimes it's like there is, there is a bit more. You get a sense that there's something a bit more that this person it's, could it's be. It's really rewarding too in the sense of what you can offer to other people. So a couple, just a couple of little quick stories. There was, uh, we were running this uh, language revitalization program for Fano and Ngati Fakowe, and we would always analyze. We, we used to get them together at the end of every month, have a two-day wānanga like this, mainly on functional language in the home, and then we're, on a Sunday we would evaluate how they've been going over the last month. And it was about eight months into the program and one, one, one of the fathers stood up and he says, and he started to cry and he said, my kid's behaviour has changed. Ever since we started bringing Māori into the house, their behaviour has changed. They were naughty little buggers eight months ago. And now all of a sudden their behaviour is a lot better. They're starting to listen, they're starting to do things and it's because we're instructing them in Māori. Because you know, we just used to give them basic instructions and he say, we're, instruct we're instructing them in Māori and they're listening. They go, oh. You know, it's like something's clicked in their DNA or something that's changed their behaviour. But if you think about the reo, it does uh, a lot of the uh, tikanga around reo uh, dictates how we should behave as whānau to each other, children, parents, all that kind of stuff. A lot of that tikanga is in the reo. The other story was uh, Ngāti Whakaui had a kura reo two weeks ago and I went back to do a bit of a session with them. And afterwards this fella came up to me, I hadn't seen him in years. And I was wondering where he was because he was in Ngāwha prison. But he's uh, been in and out of prison all his life. He's a real sort of hard nut down in Rotorua. He's a bit of an urban legend down there. It's being you know, the tough guy. Apparently he went into Mount Eden and ended up being the kingpin in there while he was in there. He's been in and out of prison the whole time. He's reading the paper. Oh yes, he's on the run again from the cops. All that kind of stuff. Real, real sort of uh, notorious kind of a chap. And he come up afterwards and I said, oh, oh, chill, because hey, you been? And blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, have you learned the deal? He said, yeah, I started to teach myself in Ngāwha prison. Had nothing else to do, so I thought I'll start learning the deal. I said, who are your tutors? He said, he had none. I've just been picking up books, reading, teaching myself reo over the past six or seven years or whatever it is. And, and then he said to me, you know, bro, I'm never going back to prison. I said, why is that? And he said, because I've found, I've found my, my calling. I know what I, where I should be now. And his reo was actually really good. He's talking Māori. He said, I've found my thing, and now what I want to do is use this, what I've learned, go back in the prisons and, and sort of teach other prisoners. If you pick up the reo, it gives you some direction. Yeah? And so it can, it can have that kind of impact on you, eh? It can have real big impact on you and, and, and on others. It's real life changing. Oh, and actually, sorry, this wasn't the final version of it. Under Amazing Mentors, it should say reo a iwi as well, because the state of the reo in your iwi is an impact on you as well. Uh, whether there are resources for you to access, whether you can easily go to wānanga that, if your iwi is at that place, because if they're not, it's quite different for you as well. Uh, and these are back to traits. A little bit competitive, Mr Morrison. A little bit, just a little bit. Then they they wahanga kare pai e tino fakai engari heti kataku, and not just competitive with other people, competitive with himself, uh, and therefore that's a big part of who he is and how quickly he wants to be able to do things. So if you are like that, you see you're all smiling. That means that they all agree with me. Uh, <laughs> And all we are, as, as Māori in general, we're quite competitive. When we do our Māori for grown-ups, wānanga, we always get them to be competitive because psychopaths like this one come out and they do their best work when they, when they are competing. <laughs> um, they here to trait or impact as well, probably the fact that we kōrero Māori, puts a ring on a Māori-speaking wahine. So um, that's a really big thing. And I don't want anyone to break up with anyone as a result of this. If you... <laughs> If you get together with someone, kai te pai tēnā, uh, but it is a huge impact and I think about this was what both of us wanted to do. I was at a certain level, Scott, well, I'll talk about this, Scotty obviously was stronger, but um, I just can't, it, it's another 
part of a relationship. And a friend of mine was saying how hard it is, and she was in tears saying, I thought I could do it by myself, but I can't. And I don't want to make my relationship the cost. So we've got to find a way that we can make it work. And that is, that actually, their kids are excellent, they're ill, uh, but it just means that she's going to have to speak English at home more so that they can actually maintain their awesome relationship. So everyone's going to find their own dynamic. With us, I, was, I said to Scotty, kai akwe. I gave him license to correct me. And some people, when I've said that, they go, oh, hell no. There is no way that I would do that to my tāne. And the big picture for me, though, is I just wanted our kids to have real and, and that was why I got over myself and in terms of ego I asked him to but he, he's always gentle with it and he won't you know so we can finish our hui now because we have found the, uh, the remedy to create a critical mass of Māori language speakers so thank you all for coming <laughs> go home find a Māori speaking wainio tāne and go and breed there you go but it well would done. have been a huge tension for us if we had decided that we were going to do this and then we didn't. I don't know what it would have been like, but quick, uh, we'll talk about that briefly. So now another huge impact is that our relationship with our tamariki is exclusively in the reo. So we'll go speak the reo to the kids and turn around and within seconds be speaking Pākehā and they know that and they do that as well. Uh, so that's a big factor. Uh, and this one is a perfectionist. Another thing, th these are the two things he didn't agree. I'm not a perfectionist. Oh, ha, ha. Um, but he is. And so that's one factor. Oh, you get onto that. You that. Um, and then I guess, hehanga hua kaputa, iputa, oranga tinana in terms of Scotty's work, obviously, reo and, and media. Oranga Hinengaro, authoring books, PhD study, Oranga Waidua, so that's in terms of actually being to, able to express your Waidua Māori and Karakia, uh, what they do with the, with the senior Jedi Knights, as I call them. <laughs> ah, yeah, so if we go back to where we were when the um, Tamariki were born, is that where we are? Or is it, yeah, should it be yeah, the next one? Yeah. yeah. About 10 minutes. Okay. 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 Yeah, so where we were at, um, Scotty was obviously a fluent speaker, but he actually had to learn a lot more than he realised at the mm -hmm. time just to be able to speak that ill to the kids because it's such a different kind of language. Uh, yeah, different we context, so you know, you, when you don't have kids, you don't go to the playground, ne, generally, unless you're a weirdo. <laughs> but um, as soon as you have kids, oh, you're off to the playground. And then you get to the playground and you go, shit, what's the, what's the word for a seesaw? And what's the word for a swing? And what's the word for the roundabout thing and all that? So all of a sudden, you're into the books because you've got to find that language to be able to uh, maintain a Māori language environment in those contexts. Yeah, so, yeah, so whole new language. We just made up little jingles. I guess maybe it's from working in radio, but I found jingles help with me. So I'd, for a seesaw, T-M-E-M-E is the word. And I was like, oh, I can't remember that. Um, so every time I jump on it, we go T-M-E-M-E, T-M-E-M-E, rungararo, rungararo, rungararo e. So now the kids sing it and it helps me learn it. It's kind of like, give us a crack. Show us your crack. Um, and if you have something that remembers, <laughs> but show us your seesaw. Uh, so we've got heaps of different ones like that. We've got... Ka mau mahara ra nei koutou, hao te kuku? Tiemi emi, emi, show us your crack. Tiemi so those are the kind of things that definitely help and obviously that's when we reached out and created Māori for Grown Ups because we needed mates, we had no friends. We needed uh, coffee groups, freaked me out and could only do it with like-minded people so that's when we created our ropu. But yeah, we didn't have a language plan, we just had a wedding and then we winged it. Um, but we were both staunch about the kids having their birthright but also having the things that we didn't have. And we know that we just didn't want our kids to ever have to work this hard to gain something that should be theirs. And, you know, the times that it makes me feel like it uh, has made a huge difference to who they are is how, particularly when they express their emotions and their wairua, I just feel that I've given them a lot more safety, a uh, lot more expression of their wairua, um, you know, with the real. And I think 
I have so much respect for women and a lot of Pākehā women came to, come to our events because they understand, they see this part of their child that perhaps isn't from them, but they desperately want their children to feel good about for their self-esteem. And it's definitely part an opportunity, that's how I see it. Um, so yeah, we're both staunch about it, both stubborn, but it's hard because our kids didn't sleep, so we didn't sleep. And often, I went back to work um, when first baby was three months old, 4.30 in the morning, so I'd be up expressing milk at four o'clock in the morning, thinking of the NWA song, expressing myself. And um, so we're really tired, and yeah, so, so it's definitely hard. Yeah, remember that uh, exercise that Charisma did with you guys this morning about you know walking down to the other end, and then she said, this is what well that was the time eh? the time was way back here and uh didn't include work and sleep well i mean i mean sleep's just been off the agenda for 10 years basically <laughs> so that's why we sleep deprived but it's all you know in terms of that's the i mean you know how christmas says you've got to give something away or make some kind of commitment to be able to achieve what you want in terms of uh, a language plan and, and, and embedding the language in your family and that was right there i think that's basically our sacrifice is that you don't worry about sleep really well, the thing about tamariki is, well, they'll give you instant results. It's not like a diet where you have to wait six weeks. If you know, if you start speaking to them today, they'll start speaking back to you. And adults can do that too, but adults just have to drop their hang-ups before they do that. Uh, so, yeah, we learned new kupu, we wānanga kupu. Oh, yeah, we created this hapori, because you have to create your own hapori, but particularly in an urban setting. Um, so these are all, you know, I see a lot of faces. If I don't know you, then I see you at a lot of events. And that's important. And we all do that in different ways. We have those get-togethers, we have quiz nights, all of those kind of things. That, that's something that's been hammered into you guys too, eh? Since the start of the hui is creating networks and hapori of uh, Māori language speakers and using them to support you. I mean, you guys, eh, Kali, you guys are white, eh? Yeah. And there's no one, no one around, eh? So it's going to be, I mean, that's something we can flesh out throughout the day about how you can create a, a sort of a hapori of Māori language speakers in there, some kind of community or some kind of network. And I know that, that, you know, that he tai aore anō, te waipaunamu, so you mm. know there's a, lots of different challenges which I understand coming from there. So but yeah, that thing about um, being learners, I remember when Hawaiki was one and a half maybe, he comes out and he goes, ha te kupu mo tēna. okay maybe it was two, uh, and he got out and he got his papa kupu and he was looking up a word and it was upside down, I mean he's not a child genius, but he got the idea that in our whānau if we don't know a word we go and look for it and I'm quite happy for that to be part of the culture of our whānau and that is that when we don't know something we look for it, we learn. You yeah, be quite strategic about how you learn the reo. So these, are, you know, as we, you've been given a lot of different strategies about how how to learn. Uh, you've you've heard uh, from Tatere and and uh, Winnie about their experiences and how they managed their help or how they learned the reo. And now you're hearing about the, sort of the pathway that I follow. But if you're strategic about it, there's a lot of different research you can do, and and some of it says that. Um, if you learn the, the 100 most common words in a particular language, that, that is actually forms 50% of all conversations in that language. So then you've got to work out what are those 100 words. The next, uh, the next um, step is, is the most common 1,000 words, and those make up 90% of, of general conversations in that language. So you don't want to be going to a class and learning the word for an algal bloom. Because that, that's not going to be one of the most 1,000 common words. Now, I think in Pataka Kupu there's 40,000 words, is that right? Is there 40,000 Māori words in Pataka Kupu? So, how do you work out what are the 1,000 most common words which are going to make up 90% of your conversation? Hey, because you don't want to be wasting time learning, learning a whole lot of words that you, you're not going to use probably in general conversation, so that's what you've got to work out. So look that, at where you are, yeah. That is what is in this. <laughs> because...